Okay, uh, good morning everyone and hope you had a good uh, a good night's sleep and recharge for statistics and metabolo uh, metabolanalyst today. So um, this is a uh, uh, slides for Creative Commons, uh, every, you saw it yesterday. And um, today's uh, uh, module this morning, first one is background in statistical method. So uh, yesterday, uh, we basically, um, David introduced all the technologies uh, underlying metabolomics. So how the data was generated. And we also had a, a labs how to do the spectral processing uh, for OMR, uh, GCMS and LCMS. So in the end, and we have uh, a list of metabolites with the concentrations or peaks with the intensities. And uh, today's uh, goal is try to um, understand uh, what are the patterns, what are the biological changes. Hopefully you can come up with a, a good hypothesis to, to do more validation uh, study. So in general, omics uh, is uh, give you a lot of the leads and potential directions, but usually you need to do some more targeted analysis to uh, finish the story. So this is, um, not it's all back to the traditional ones. Uh, here we, let's see. Hmm. I cannot proceed. Okay. So uh, today's um, uh, main main uh, goal is just from the tables or from the list to patterns and to biomarkers and to pathways. So this is um, uh, the learning objectives. So. Before we uh, actually start using the tools and uh, get to get the results, we need to understand in this um, basic concepts in omics data analysis. And uh, although this is a focus on the metabolomics, a lot of these concepts very generally applicable to all the other data analysis, uh, like uh, transcriptomics, microbiome. So I, I, I do want to share uh, these uh, concepts. And if you learn this omics, you definitely help uh, learning other uh, omics. And uh, the key focus actually on the p-values. And uh, there's a lot of the things going on. People are very superstitious about p-values. P-value is significant, you think it is true, which uh, shouldn't, should be moderated. So this is not necessarily the case. Biology is most important. But this also extreme. People don't give enough replicates to get uh, to have the proper power to get a good p-value. So we always need to have a right attitude uh, about p-values, interpret p-values, and um, come up with a reasonable hypothesis or interpretation. And uh, also we're going to introduce about uh, a common uh, multivariate statistical met method like PCA and a PLSDA, and which are very, very popular in metabol uh, metabolomics. But it's also quite useful. For example, PCA or their uh, de variance is Quite common in single cell, uh, uh, single cell RNA data analysis. So understanding how PCA works, how to interpret PCA, uh, is important. So a few years ago, you think uh, PCA is advanced. Now it's really regular. So try to have an intuitive feeling on PCA, interpret PCA, and uh, and PSD is uh, basically similar to PCA, but is more supervised. So we will come 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 to it more details on that later. And uh, we're also going to uh, introduce about this uh, more classical machine learning, like clustering and performance evaluation cross-validation. And uh, I'm not going to talk about the deep learning uh, neural networks AI this year, maybe next year if there's strong feelings, even it's, um, <laughs> it seems quite uh, hot. And, uh, but let's see. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, as I mentioned, um, all the omics uh, share a same data analysis share a same pattern. So I put it in the nutshell. It's just a summarizing how the, at a high level everything almost identical. So the data processing and the quality checking. This is platform specific. This is omics specific. For example, if you're doing RNAseq and you are dealing with sequencing data and how to deal with the fast queue files and that's specific to RNA sequencing. And if you from an RMR, and that specific data format is directly from the machine. So you need a specific things, 
math spec also very uh, have a unique format. But after you get out of that specific formatting and processing them using the tools we dis uh, discussed yesterday, and you will get a list of features, B genes, B metabolites, or uh, tables with their abundance profile. Uh, then you can do a statistical uh, analysis. And uh, when you do statistical analysis, this is shared across all omics. So for example, the common goals is a comparison like a t-test ANOVA and clustering. How do you do a heat map and see the patterns and the classification. This is uh, shows a PCL or linear discriminant analysis or even a SVM. So all the technology we use today is uh, it can be applicable to other omics. And uh, here is that uh, if after you found patterns and significant features, what you uh, want to do next is you that you want to interpret them. And how do you do that? It's enrich analysis, pathway analysis. So this is again is common. And just a library need to be created a different uh, metabolites and genes <coughs> or proteins. And finally, <coughs> there's some unique uh, functions. For example, if you're doing clinical, you some uh, survival analysis, biomarker analysis. And if you in some environmental um, toxicogenomics, there's some dose response analysis. So this is slightly different, but uh, let's say 17.5% uh, or 18% is the, the core of the approach is shared across. So understanding these concepts, it's basically you understand the other omics uh, as well. So um, uh, let's go to the statistical analysis. And this is basically the steps we will going through it. it um, in the coming 17-ish uh, slides. So how do we do it? First, we need to read in the data. And what is data is uh, usually it's a matrix, a table. It's, uh, you, you can open it from Excel and you see it's uh, uh, samples in the column or sample in the rows and the column and, uh, um, and the features or metabolites is in a different, so it's basically a squared data and you can save as a text file then upload to um, statistical software. For example, MetabAnalyst we are going to accept such a table. After you read the table in, into the computer and next time, next step is uh, uh, visualize data. Why we want to visualize is we want, we want to see whether data looks, no, looks right. So um, uh, again, this is a, a, just a, a very important uh, procedural things. So you want to make sure data is, uh, looks, mm, looks, uh, looks normal before you uh, spend enough time to go, uh, go to the next step. So this is a quality checking step. And if you have a QC sample, it's clearly you would like to see with how QC lines, uh, where it's uh, uh, located compared to other samples, whether there are some patterns at the beginning. If you see some patterns um, at this step, already very good sign. Uh, hopefully that pattern is meaningful. Uh, um, and uh, uh, the other one is um, uh, after doing this a QC and you want to do a normalization, uh, why we want to do normalization? Because the statistical tools are mainly developed based on normal distribution. So uh, it works uh, much better if your data is normal. And also some, uh, the batch effect correction usually is happened at the normalization step. So data normalization usually can uh, reduce the batch effect. So normalization is going to uh, enhance your signal and um, it's much uh, better for the statistical analysis in the next step. So uh, finally, we go to statistical machine learning. Uh, we're talking about the uh, univariate, like a t-test, ANOVA, and PCA heat map. So this is, a, uh, we just need to understand the concept of what, of what it is and how to interpret the result. Because the uh, tools actually nowadays is quite common. So it's just that uh, we need to, uh, before we get there, we need to do all the necessary steps, make sure the data mm, is uh, good data and the result is meaningful. And uh, uh, believe me or not, is that uh, I found most time using a tool, uh, tremendous effort is how to get the data <laughs> into proper format to, so the tool can accept. And uh, um, uh, this is uh, interesting, but uh, uh, we, with the time, we do understand that there's some uh, other uh, format issues. For example, how to save a CSV format, a TXT format from Excel. And it's, uh, 
seems easy, but a lot of time it's um, not so straightforward. So from the computer, uh, computer perspective, uh, or the data analysis perspective, and there's two types of data. One is, uh, uh, we, here is the big X, is a, is a real data, like a peak intensity table, a compound concentration table. This is your numerical uh, table, okay? And the other one is metadata. Metadata is data about data. So the, it's the descri descriptors of the X. So for example, class labels, experimental factors, and sometimes people want to describe something even about the compound class labels. So it is, a, um, so most time we analyze the data just on the X. And if we use a Y is either for label, coloring your samples or for supervised analysis. So these are two different things. And uh, computer must understand what is your data, what is your metadata. So uh, what's the goal uh, after we get this data into a computer? And uh, so first is tell you which data is, which feature, mainly we're talking about your compound or peaks, which are significant, p-value, uh, let's say lower than 0.05. And this is a, a most common, commonly, uh, common question, the one to find the significant features uh, that are different among experimental conditions. And on the other uh, side is that you want to see the big picture. What are the group patterns, like clustering patterns? And uh, if, if it is significant, there's some things, can you build a classifier to predict, uh, predict the next, um, like next, uh, if you see the samples, do you know it's disease or control uh, or healthy? So uh, this is, you want to have the rules, have the models. So this is more advanced. And our focus is mainly on the significant features and the clustering patterns. And uh, the other one is more advanced. The metabolists do have these uh, things, but uh, uh, I will wait for your questions if, uh, <laughs> if you actually get there. And uh, <clears throat> so X is quantitative data, and uh, it could be that uh, metabolites concentrations, microarray, its intensities, or RNA6 gene counts. And uh, uh, so it is uh, uh, different, uh, it's continuous or discrete, use slightly different uh, uh, model, uh, statistical models. For example, continuous usually normal distribution and uh, discrete like uh, uh, sequence counts is a um, Poisson distribution. So they are, uh, uh, they are treated differently in statistics, but uh, somehow uh, there's ways you can actually convert. For example, uh, you can convert uh, uh, Poisson distribution, which is this this discrete uh, distribution, um, more into normal distribution, then apply the regular statistics, and uh, you don't lose power. So it is uh, possible to uh, to um, to uh, switch between, but you need to have a uh, have a concept. If you don't do the um, proper uh, procedures, you directly apply uh, uh, after statistics, and uh, that's conceptually is uh, not right. So even sometimes it's working well. For example, you apply t-test on the discrete values, and you still get some good result. But it's uh, uh, it's not really designed for that. So you need to um, uh, convert do some conversion. And uh, uh, if we talk about why, why is uh, metadata? And uh, sometimes people can write a very detailed text about uh, what's the sample about at free text. So uh, it's readable by, uh, understandable by, by a human, but it's not for computer. So computer, you can be yes or no, case or control, zero or one. They are the same for the com computer. And uh, I, I would suggest most time we should try to focus on the binary data because that's very easy to interpret. And also the statistical method is very powerful for two class. Excuse me, Dr. Z. Yeah. I, I have a question on your previous slide. How, how do you know if your data is continuous or discrete? Oh, if you, <laughs> if you <laughs> open it, you can see here. And you have the fractions, and uh, you, you see there's a dot, right? This is concentration. Oh, oh, oh OK. I'm sorry. I get it. Sorry. <laughs> this is a top. Uh, that uh, figure is a gene uh, ensemble gene ID. This is from RNA data. You can see it's integers. A zero yeah. or uh, integer count. So, 
Um, but sometimes, you, you, <laughs> as uh, people doing bioinformatics, they don't receive the raw data. They receive data already uh, processed. So once you normalize, you'll get some uh, in, uh, fractions. So that time, you're probably not sure what original data looks like. You need to contact them. So uh, for data analysis, I do encourage people who in the data science or bioinformatics to understand how the raw data is generated. So you, uh, because once you're in the middle, you don't know the previous uh, uh, steps and it's very dangerous and all your effort could be wasted if the previous one is not uh, done properly. So uh, um, definitely this is, um, uh, we should uh, get into that. So, uh, so uh, uh, sorry, Jeff. Uh, so you mentioned that we should not use uh, some kind of normalized data. Uh, for example, if it is uh, about gut microbiota, we should not use the uh, relative frequencies here for doing uh, a statistical analysis. Is that correct? Yeah. If uh, you are uh, you are doing bioinformatics, you are doing data science. You should get the raw counts. Don't use normalized data. A lot of statistics works best on the raw counts. They build, have built in um, normalization to do that. Once you have normalization, I, I, I can guess we, you, you probably use one of the most commonly used normalization uh, count per million. I, I'm not sure the other things. They, uh, they, they will introduce some bias and uh, some up, up stats, stats won't be um, applicable. So. Uh, if you know what you're doing is ask raw data and uh, you, do, you do your normalization. So once you have normalized data, we cannot go get the raw data. If you have the raw data, we can get normalized data. That's uh, what I'm saying. So, uh, uh, so it's preferred raw data, just a table. And uh, next step is not hard, so hard to do. But once you get normalized data and it's hard to retrieve back, that's, that's the thing. Thank you. Uh, so for the why is uh, I, I recommend uh, focus on two groups and uh, yes, you can have three groups or four groups or 10 groups. Uh, it's good that you have a global view like using PCA or clustering, say the patterns. But when you come to interpretation and also build a classifier, it's much better in the two groups. So it's very easy to understand. And uh, for me, it's that uh, I, if I'm doing a two-way ANOVA or three-way ANOVA, my mind doesn't work. I just don't cannot think about that. It's, so it's, um, it's much better to uh, stratify your data or just to think about um, how do you compare your current main question versus the other. Don't put everything together. You want to solve it. In the end, it's uh, uh, very hard to interpret. So uh, this is not my, my uh, I'm against it. It's just uh, when you do a very introduce so many factors, uh, if you have so many replicate and have, um, it's probably fine in the traditional statistics, but for omics, usually you don't have so many replicates and in, uh, you actually have so many features and uh, uh, statistics or machine learning that working, uh, design for omics, then working for that complex design. So, uh, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a just a reality. Um, and uh, uh, so try to not make a very complex uh, multi-factors in your experimental design uh, for the omics. So that's, that's uh, if you have so many replicates still, when you compare everything compared to your control. So you're doing two uh, disease uh, like uh, control, but don't, don't do uh, everything together in one go. If uh, you, if you're doing it, um, uh, just uh, put in the control versus your condition one, control versus condition two, and if you do it, understand your data very well, then you put them together. That's what I'm saying is uh, simple and gradually introduce complexity. Don't do everything in one go, especially at the beginning, which will um, uh, uh, prevent you from developing a good story. And uh, that's, that's uh, my feeling in through the years. And uh, so uh, how, uh, how this is a, a, a screenshot for if you open it from Excel. And uh, for metabol analyst, if you use uh, for today, most most formats should be looks like this. Either you can put the samples in rows, for example, the control one, control two, is your samples in rows, and uh, the first column will be your group labels metadata. So the next column will be compound names. This uh, concentrations. This is targeted metabolomics, and uh, created by MR. I'm pretty sure. 
And here is uh, uh, on target metabolomics and generated from like uh, XMS. And uh, so because you have a lot of features and now features is in uh, uh, rows and the column, uh, it became samples. In that case, you have metadata labeled in the second row. So always the metadata directly describe the data, directly follow the uh, samples. So this is uh, intuitive and uh, you can upload everything in, um, uh, in one, one data table. So only, only yesterday, because you upload the spectra, and we need a metadata because the spectra itself don't tell too much about the group. And most time, and this one is very convenient. You don't need to um, upload two files, just uh, one, one table you label in Excel and save it as CSV or TXT and then upload. So uh, this is a uh, common terms uh, when we talk about statistics. And uh, first is uh, um, dimension. So dimension is number of variables. We are talk, not talking about samples. So if you're talking about the uh, metabolomics, you list uh, hundreds of uh, dimensions, like hundreds of the metabolites, or um, you rarely we get thousands of metabolites, and probably uh, peaks will be there. That's a uh, dimension. And the uh, univariate is uh, we marry one variable per, per subject. And multivariate is marry many variables per subject. And so we omics always uh, multivariate, but a lot of times we, we use univariate statistics and uh, you can see uh, we just treat one variable uh, at a time and ignoring other variable. So it will lose a huge advantage of the covariance between the variable because we, we just uh, consider one variable in its isolation. Um, but again, univariate is the basic starting point and don't think univariate well, uh, it's a, uh, it's a, um, it's a, a it's very, very good for, um, for initial data, uh, uh, data analysis, just to see what's going on and uh, understand your data. Uh, and uh, so this is, um, uh, we shouldn't have some bias, uh, univariate, multivariate naturally better than uh, univariate. So uh, we should try to, uh, uh, try to see when we go to uh, data understanding, and um, univariate is much the easiest to understand. So uh, when we see what's the difference between univariate and multivariate, we probably see what's the covariance, what's the new story coming out. So we need to use both. A question, please. Yeah. Uh, dimensions, are you, is that the number of variables or should that be the number of measurements? Yes, uh, number of measurement or number of variables. So measurements uh, okay. is, uh, it's uh, we talk about compounds, right? Uh, yes. So. yes, in that time. Okay. So um, here is that. Uh, how do we summarize the data? We can, if, we, if you uh, if we mirror uh, the compounds uh, across. Uh, I'm like, sorry to interrupt you. I have a question regarding to the variables. Um, normally, in a statistics for doing uh, analysis, you need to use independent variables. And for me, that was a question every time I use analysis and do multiple comparison, because you, we take the analysis of the intensity of the peak, of each peak from the same chromatogram. Are those independent variables? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. I, I'm, I'm, I, I totally understand your, uh, your, uh, what you said. Yes, I mean, X, we usually talk about independent variables. One is Y is more responsive variables. So the, I'm, I'm strongly influenced by machine learning. I don't, uh, uh, even I understand what's traditional uh, statistics talking about it, but I, I use uh, uh, variables and uh, here. So it refers to independent uh, variables. Whether it's independent or not, because we talk about multi uh, omics, we know it's actually, they have some, it's independent. Maybe it's uh, from it's 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 the it's, it's you are referring to why or within the variable themselves. So uh, it is X. I think this uh, this you did refer to as independent of uh, independent variables. Yeah. Yeah, but my question was. Ours are not independent. If you use metabolomics or targeted or untargeted, you use the same chromatogram for measuring different variables in the same subject. So the variable will be linked to the run. 
yeah, <laughs> I, I get it. But uh, uh, this is a naming thing, and uh, how it is. Uh, um, we just refer to uh, variables. We uh, in statistics, and uh, I, I know they talk about this independent things and IID in. I mean identical or independent or random issue. So there's a lot of assumptions there and we clearly violate that, we know that. So, uh, but how, what's a better term? I, I'm, I'm, I'm also, uh, I'm with you, but I, I don't know how, the, how we can better give a better names here. But uh, we, we just talk about data, okay? How do we give the name? <laughs> yeah. So. And uh, here is that, uh, let's go back to this, uh, how do we understand the data? Uh, for example, one metabolite, uh, glucose, we measure uh, through about uh, uh, 85 uh, patients. And uh, how do we describe it? We can, um, for a computer, they can get 85 numbers and they in their memory do whatever, they, they have no problem, million data points are all fine. But for our human brain, we cannot get a deal with that large number. We probably have a, a few, five or 10, below 10, we can do it. More than that, we need some help. And we need to summarize the data. If we talk about uh, one variables married across 85 patients, how do we summarize the data? One, there's several things. One is the uh, center, basically the central tendency. So if it's normal, distribu normal distribution, the center is a uh, very informative. You can see the first uh, on, on your right, the first uh, top, uh, center. The center will be the most dense part. If you know the location of the center, you already know a large part of the information. And the second one is the uh, variability, the spread of the data. So if it's very narrowly focused, everything is almost hit at the center. You know using the center is very descriptive, very representative of your data. So this mean of this, if it's normal distribution, will be very meaningful. You don't need it more, much more. And it, I'm talking about normal distribution, but if it's by module and the user center is not helpful, so you need to uh, use more like uh, here is a uh, um, quantiles range IQR. So normal distribution, all this kind of center spread uh, distribution is the best is for normal distribution, especially narrowly focused, but then more spread, more variant from normal distribution. And uh, such a summary is less meaningful. So. Um, so that's that's uh, you need to put in mind is uh, we uh, talking about data mainly using normal distribution and we using mean or media and you can see the challenge here is that if data behave as normal we are fine if data don't behave normal we use just uh, these numbers it's actually away from reality. So uh, this is box and whisk plot, and um, we, um, as I, a lot of time I receive question about how to interpret that. I just refer them to the <laughs> Wikipedia. And because this is also, we got it from Wikipedia. And I hope uh, you guys are fine with uh, a box and whisk plot. So it is a median, and it's a, I think it's a one point uh, uh, quarter. So it's a quarter from, and so it's a 75%. This is twenty-five um, percent. So the this uh, inter IQR is basically from twenty-five percent to fifteen percent. So this one is more meaningful, uh, more more robust uh, compared to um, uh, using the whole range. Why is because here you can have some outlier on the top and bottom, but if you use twenty-five percent to uh, to seventy-five percent, it's more uh, conservative, but it's more robust. This is something. Uh, we do normalization or using a lot of this uh, up quantile or inter quantile to add the variance rather than use the whole from minimum to maximum because outlier can play a big role and in IQR is much stable. And uh, here is that uh, since we're talking about the challenges in uh, compare means without talking about the variance, uh, we can see even the same distance between, same difference between the means like group one versus group two. And uh, you can see that this difference is the same, but if the distribution, the spread is, is different, the confidence is different. So uh, in the top, like uh, on the right side on the top, uh, we, we clearly see we are gonna get a very significant p-values because they are almost totally separate, only have a, a very few overlap, but on the bottom, it, there's a lot of overlap. So, 
the challenge is we need to consider both mean and variance, uh, and they all estimate from your data. So the more data point you have, the more confident it will. So the less data point is became less confident. So this is a, um, a challenge for omics with less number of uh, replicates. So uh, we talking a lot about normal distribution. Everybody should be <laughs> very grateful for this magic distribution people discovered and described and actually working a lot of lot of the life sciences. We, uh, I'm, um, my background is not initial from statistics, so I'm from more med medical field. So when I say normal distribution, I'm just always want to see, is that re real? And it, it's, it's most time it is indeed distributed as, as that. The magic number, it, it's in 13 to 14. When you have this uh, 13 to 14 replicates and you marry from some biological re response and you see some distribution is very close to it. And if you apply some normalization, actually it's very normal. So uh, eventually I became more and more comfortable with this uh, concept, normal distribution and stuff. But at the beginning, I'm just thinking about how, why it's behave like that. Um, so uh, the, the, you can see the formula, it uh, looks scary, but uh, we just, we don't need, need to uh, remember this. Computer always deal with normal distribution, so efficient. And that's another reason is that we want things to be normal, uh, normally distributed. Otherwise the computing uh, time going to be much longer if you assume the otherwise. So we will describe about the permutation. If we don't know the distribution, we're doing permutation, which is quite costly in terms of computing time. And uh, so, um, so normal distribution is our friend. Is normal distribution is very powerful. So if we can normalize our data to this one, we will have much better chance to discover something significant. And uh, uh, in reality is that we found a lot of the distributions uh, uh, like a unimodal, bimodal, or skewed. So skewed is quite common. And bimodal is also quite common now nowadays from uh, RNA-seq data. So it's pr assumably from different cell population or development stage. So, uh, so this is uh, sometimes concerning because I, I know the next statistical analysis is using norm uh, normal assumption for that. So normalization is always uh, preferred. Uh, you, you cannot make it a perfect normal, but at least it close, so uh, improve it. And uh, so if data is not normal and uh, the, the, the algorithm assume normal, so we cannot, uh, we cannot um, redesign a new algorithm. If you, 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 you are, you're really talented, you can design algorithm to fit your data. And, but most of us, we don't develop in algorithms we have control over data. So we, we transform our data to normal distribution to suit an uh, algorithm rather than develop algorithm to suit your data. So you, you see the uh, uh, different ways how it works is uh, uh, because we have no control of the algorithm. We want to apply t-test. Now we need to be normally distributed unless you come up with something different. So uh, <coughs> Jeff, I have a question here. Uh, like uh, we have a data like from a very uh, from starting from a raw perspective when we have a raw data we know that uh, in the annotation like in a pipeline of sick, uh, data analysis we do the normalization but uh, how can we decide like we uh, the data required the normalization or not I mean in the pipeline it's fine like the next step of uh, raw data processing is to go for the normalization yeah. But like, but if we have a data, how we will decide? Like, if now it's required the normalization. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's a very good question. So uh, you need to visualize your data. <laughs> so a lot of times, uh, uh, QC uh, data visualization is the first step before you go to normalization. That's the step I mentioned in the uh, previous slides. So visualize data. If the data is normal already normally distributed, there's nothing. You just choose now to go to next. And normalization also don't have a uh, fixed rule. So which, which approach is the most suitable for your data? So uh, this is um, also uh, try and error. So you need to um, try the simple one and see if it uh, fix it. Um, um, but uh, again, it's you need to uh, visualize your data and to see its distribution, see how, how, how it looks normal or not. And uh, there's some statistical test to see normal distribution, but the statistics for multivariate normal distribution is not so strong. And univariate is fine. So in the end is that uh, you visualize and see, um, we will 
demonstrate how it uh, how it works. And here is the distribution. You can see the skewed distribution, and then on the right is the normal distribution. So. Um, uh, so uh, all you need to do is apply log. So uh, a lot of the um, distribution is that uh, uh, there's some um, maybe outlier and very extreme high values. So you get a very long tail on the right. So this is common in the biological environment. But if you apply log, log is basically have a big penalty to a big value and also exaggerating the small values. So, and you can see that uh, they push uh, the, this whole distribution from the uh, skewed to the left all the way to the center. So here, uh, while we are on here, just make sure you understand that trans log transformation because they make a smaller values uh, um, in large of smaller va value and uh, reduce the big impact of big value. Usually we don't have too much issues with big value slightly reduced because they are still ranked at top and uh, number one. The issue is usually with the left side, the smaller value, and it's been exaggerated or uh, uh, enhanced. A lot of time, the smaller value is noise, okay? It's close to baseline. So this is usually not a big issue for um, targeted because targeted, you actually manually use some reference and uh, standard, so usually fine. But for untargeted, sometimes you, uh, so you enhance the noise. So normal uh, log distribution, uh, is there some other flavors for log uh, transformation. So, um, so this is something, log transformation is very simple, <clears throat> very powerful, um, but there's some downside is make some noise uh, become more pronounced. So uh, this is one we, uh, we just uh, choose log. So you, you can see um, several compound or something, sometimes ratio, you apply log, it became more and more close to normal. So again, we don't know it's, uh, we, we can clearly see the left side is not normal, so we need to do normal. But after doing that, you see, you see are they normal? And uh, it's better than not normalized. So it's, we, we tried our best. So uh, we cannot get 100% comfort. We make it an absolutely uh, normal distribu distribute. We don't know that and there's no guarantee, but at least uh, you don't try is wrong. So that's how I would like to say. So try your best to make it more normal. And uh, uh, sometime the community going to publish some papers on which one is the best using some good benchmarking data. And usually if you see such um, publications, it's uh, cited like uh, citation like crazy. I don't know, I, I put that uh, centering scaling and normalization for metabolomic data published in 2006 and which cited almost 2000 times. It's very um, uh, simple, but it's just a very thorough. So, and it's very satisfying. You read it through and make a lot of you clear a lot of the doubts. And this is something I, I, I just tell you is normalization uh, is no hard rules. So you need to understand in what's the risks, what's the challenges, but what's the common practice and together with your experience by reading with what's published. So try simple first and gradually go to a more advanced and see the visualize the data before and after. So this is one you can see within uh, Metabo Analyst, we have uh, so many different uh, options. Uh, sample normalization, data transformation, for example, data transformation, there's a log, there's a cubic root normalization, and data scaling is about the mean centering, auto scaling, Pareto scaling, range scaling. So um, I don't com I won't comment on each individual matter because uh, it just takes time. But on the other hand is that we have good documentation on, uh, um, on each method. Also, uh, there's papers referred to and you need to read and think. So this one just takes some thinking to, um, to find out which one uh, most suitable for your data. There's definitely, there's a established practice for each uh, field. For example, NMR, and they tend to use normalization by reference samples and uh, also a reference normalization by some by median. So uh, there's a practice. So you can always gain some comfort by see uh, papers published in Nature and Science use approach and you follow these things, at least you know you are not wrong. And uh, gradually understand it better, you can try to uh, more adventurous, see whether it improved your result. But begin uh, with something that's more uh, 
more established, gradually move on. Don't just ask what's best for my data. And there's no good answer. That's uh, because you know your data best. That's the one. So uh, um, now let's uh, f fix that uh, you read in the data, visualize the data, decide that you need to do some normalization or not. Then you, then you, then you get your data normalized, assume at here. And when you normalize your data, you do some statistics and machine learning test. So this is uh, overall thinking. Wait, Jeff? Yeah. Sorry, uh, before moving to the next step. So in, uh, especially in LCMSs, we always come up with a lot of missing values. So is it advisable to estimate the missing values or what's the best practice on uh, missing values? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, you might have an analyst, uh, they do have, uh, it has multiple method, five or six methods for uh, infer the missing values. And um, again, this is a question, uh, have a lot of publication on that. And my preference is uh, try to do the simplest uh, possible. Uh, so for example, if you don't do missing value estimation, the default, it will use the think why are you missing these values because it's below detection limit why you, so but it's not necessarily zero and so you put a zero or missing value make some statistics not working well because they don't design with missing values but you can give a very small value so you might have an analyst they choose they find the lowest value from your lowest non-zero value from your data then you divide it by 10 or divide by five, I don't know. So assume that's your detection limit. Then use the detection limit to replace all your missing values. So you can go to next. So this one is the uh, same as reasonable because uh, you are not absolutely sure it's zero, it's not there. So you just uh, de below detection limit. But there's also other, other approach like using k-means, uh, for example. I want to find another sample it's so similar to my sample, but for this particular variable, it has a value. I'm going to replace with that or replace with the mean or median. There's so many different things, but I want to say is because we don't quite understand the distribution of LCMS spectral peaks and stuff. And you're doing this and you're going to change the data a lot. Uh, and uh, especially you see the value replaced. If that value replaces like a mean or something, uh, and that's a good number. It's a good number. And you see this number and you should detect it. Why you don't detect it? So uh, I'm, for me, it's, I'm more conservative. Try to see it from biology, from the analytical point of view. I think it's below detection limit. So purely from the analytical or statistical point, there's so many different uh, methods there. But they come with the risk. And for example, the other one is quantile normalization. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to touch it. Uh, for uh, it works very well uh, for um, RNA seq data, but when you go to metabolo metabolomics, it causes a huge difference in distribution in the end because it forces every distribution to be the same. And we are not quite sure in metabolomics why the data is looks like that. If you're doing untargeted and with so many replicates and tens tens of features, more or less it's probably okay. But doing targeted hundreds of features, if you're doing that, uh, the this tremendous impact. So, um, so statistics, statistics can give you so much uh, more power, but what is uh, uh, applicable to this technology, to this uh, or suit for that biology, it's, it's, it's not, sh not sure yet. So uh, it's a good question, but <laughs> I'm always on the conservative side. I try to do the minimal change of the data. Uh, Jeff, can I ask questions? Sure. So the so outlier, have you uh, any suggestion about how to deal with the uh, outlier or actually there should be no con considering an outlier in a, at least uh, in a metabolist data? Yeah, um, outlier in metabolomics is, uh, is, uh, is an issue, more outlier and the uh, batch effect. So we do have some uh, uh, illustration about uh, what you consider outlier, what do you think it's... Uh, so outliers, you always compa compare with the mainstream and uh, all compare with QC. And so if you clearly, you see that pattern is different, you need to consult with people who collect the samples, whether the sample is mislabeled or the sample is being contaminated. Mm, so you can do something, whether you can remove or not. 
also you can try to do some um, some of the outlier can actually be uh, addressed with with the normalization for example if you don't do normalization um, you for the urine sample some of them very concentrated yes and if you do normalization you using the total uh, using some or using some media and that net outlier will be gone why because that normalization just deal with that uh, overall mass or overall volume uh, so that became actually everything's normal uh, once you do now normalization outlier is gone so uh, the the best is that uh, we don't do things blindly. We try to understand the cause of the outlier, and uh, then we will do things more, more meaningful, and we are more confident about the result. So uh, I, I, I personally found this. Um, so I, I did my PhD in uh, David's lab. That I'm sitting in between all these people who collecting samples, who, who run an instrument. So I always uh, understand the, what's going on. So I, 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 I found it's very. Um, Worrisome if uh, uh, data doing people doing data analysis is separate from people who very separate from people doing data collection. Then uh, sometimes is uh, <laughs> you you can do something that actually change the conclusion. So um, uh, again, is uh, I I just think about is uh, um, try to understanding understand more and uh, choose the way choose the m approach that uh, meaningful. Okay. Okay, thank you. So uh, here is... Uh, uh, Jeff? Yeah. Jeff, sorry. Uh, I, I don't know if I missed it or not, uh, but I would like to know more about uh, the quality control samples that are in, integrated in the series of injections. So how it's prepared, how, how it is uh, ordered in the series of injections. <laughs> Maybe David can uh, ask, uh, answer your question better. I, uh, uh, this definitely, there is... Um, uh, protocols, how to do the LCMS or GCMS, how, how do you put the uh, uh, standard or reference or running blank uh, and really depending on uh, the platform or you, even the, your technician who is, have a tradition. So every 10 samples, every uh, five samples. So I, I, I don't have a good answer myself because I don't do it uh, in the lab so far. <laughs> Yeah, Jeff, I think, I mean, there are protocols that people have published, um, and particularly uh, papers by David Broadhurst. Yeah. If you look up um, him uh, and some of the things that he's described, um, they've developed a pretty robust protocol uh, in terms of putting in quality control samples or reference samples to help, uh, help with normalization or scaling. Um, but it does differ between labs and it's okay to have it a little different between labs. Some cases it's how much you can afford or what your instrumentation is like, um, the platforms you use. But as long as you can justify it uh, and as long as um, you can point to perhaps some other protocols that are similar to it, then, then most people are satisfied. Uh, many kits, uh, like the Biocrates kit, also have a, a series or protocol in terms of their quality controls, and that's also a pretty good model uh, to use and to think about. Good. And uh, let's move on to uh, p-values. So, uh, so why we need a p-values? Because uh, uh, uncertainty, or we need a more certainty or probability. And uh, mm, we're doing statistics and uh, the reasons that we cannot get a whole population and until the at day we can marry everybody and we get that and then at, the ta at that time we just we just uh, using all samples we don't need to do <laughs> uh, the statistical p-values because we have all samples but before that day came we we are using a small subset of samples and from the samples we want to estimate the populations we want to um, uh, get some com confidence, so we need uh, statistics. So you can see that at the bottom, there's uh, some mm, something uh, based on your sampling, uh, uh, there's some variations. So uh, for the big population, some random sampling going to generally something that um, uh, not probably not the uh, same, identical, but are they statistically significant or not? And uh, you don't know, and you need to do some statistics. So what's p-value about? So p-value is, uh, um, uh, is, uh, is just uh, um, give you some, such a, uh, is, is indicated the levels of certainty or uncertainty. 
and uh, whether our uh, our result represent a genuine effect uh, in the whole population. So because we don't know the truth unless we marry everything. So we don't know the truth. So if we want an intuitive interpretation of the p-values, I'm talking about the p-values in the frequency system and general meaning like a t-test, okay? So uh, p-value is the probability that a observed result was obtained by chance. So basically, uh, if we assume the null hypothesis, null hypothesis, basically there's no effect. What's the chance you will see such an effect? For example, if uh, you said the p-value equals 0 .00, 0 0.005, so if you repeat uh, this experiment, assume there's no effect, how many times you will get that, uh, um, that, uh, uh, that uh, effect if you see the 0 0.05? That means if you do that uh, uh, 100 times, five times, you will get observed that effect, even there's no true effect. So that's just by random. So the p-values tell you the probability that observed result was obtained by chance. So if this p-value is very low, that means the chance of obtaining it by chance is low. And uh, we, we are comfortable say probably this is a real biological effect there. So we ex reject the null hypothesis, we accept, and uh, the drug treatment actually is effective. So this is all about p-values. And, uh, and so how do we calculate p-values? And uh, it's very easy if we know how we assume it's normal distribution and uh, you, you don't have to remember everything, but a computer will always tell you <laughs> uh, if you, if you know the mean and the variance uh, and you get a value where it's located. The p-value is very easy, you get that. And uh, so uh, people can rem some people really re remember it from actually just in their mind. So, uh, see the one standard deviation, two standard deviation, what's the p-values. So uh, that's, uh, we always want a normal distribution because the p-value is so easy. And, um, uh, but a lot of times uh, our sample uh, is better from omics, metabolomics. We don't know whether it is normally distributed. Oh, we are not sure where it's normally distributed. How do we still can get some p-values? Because if we don't get p-values, review is not satisfied. So we need to get some p-values. And uh, one thing is that uh, we just uh, don't assume a distribution and we can doing some, we can generate a null distribution from our data itself and uh, calculate the p-values. And this uh, uh, p-value is not based on model and based on uh, our permuted data is empirical p-values. So uh, uh, again, this, if we have a large, a large number of samples, like we have 1 million samples, or even just uh, more than uh, 200 samples, you probably get a, a p-values very close to the real p-values. So, um, so it, this is, a, but we can use computer simulation. Uh, how do we do that? Is that uh, uh, because we assume null hypothesis. Null hypothesis uh, is basically there's no effect. So your control and disease is the same. If that's the same, you can sample the samples. So your patient and the healthy group all can mix and you recalculate uh, the same statistics and, uh, and see how many times you can get the same values as you get using original lab la label. So uh, this, this is idea is basically if it's a null hypothesis true and you can randomly shuffle the label without any affecting of the conclusion because this is now, now is everything is the same um, uh, from the same distribution, no significant difference. And uh, we, if we do this again and again, like say one million times, you, you definitely will see how, what's the chance uh, you get a random effect like the one you use original label. And uh, uh, one million times is usually is too, <laughs> too computational intensive. Also, we don't really have enough sample to do that permutation. Sorry, that I might not focus. And um, so here's uh, shows um, uh, uh, just a schematic view of how the permutation is done. So this example shows um, case and control, this original label. So the case is one to nine and control is 10 to 18. 
you can see there's a big difference. The case is minus 0, 0, 0.0 something and the control is 0. 0.5 something, okay? There's a, but, but if we assume uh, they are now, then we can, we can shuffle them. So if we shuffle them, you, you see something from the control uh, became case and some case became control and recomputed their uh, difference. And uh, you can see the, the bottom mean, mean difference below. So this difference. So we repeat again and again and again. So once on the times for computer is nothing. Then we see the difference um, using the permuted value. So this is a, a very simple uh, graphic, but summarizes very well about uh, what you um, see, what's the chance of p-value. So uh, the, on the right is uh, have a red a vertical line, it's called observed. This is uh, observed using your original labels, basically a patient versus uh, uh, healthy. And you see the hu so much difference. But if you think uh, you are now hypothesis, uh, there's no difference. And you shuffle the, shuffle the samples, patient that can control just randomly uh, reassign and uh, calculate difference. And you repeat it once on times. All the repeated uh, differences are located on the left. So this uh, shaded in gray, you can see what we observed is quite different from shuffled ones. So that means just by chance, you want to obtain a difference as good as you observe. It's very, very low. So uh, in this case, it's almost zero. I don't see anything in there. But if you want to have a threshold, like say a 0 0.05, basically you, you are doing one thousand times, you're willing to see 15 times that is going to have a threshold um, higher, I will accept. This 15 times, 0 0.05 cutoff is, is blue line here. So you, you can see everything on to the right of the blue could be significant if you happen to see that effect. But now your effect is actually far away from the um, left. So you are very confident. But again, you because this is a permutation, and you can even you permutating for for to one million years, you still cannot get a zero. Okay, just because uh, the you it could be there's a chance like when you permitted one billion times, and there's a chance you get a significant, but you just cannot afford that. So let's do it reasonable. Let's uh, stop at one thousand times or ten thousand times. So uh, here is if you have three three times, so the p value will be through p equals point zero zero three, and this is a uh, um, yeah this is your empirical p values. But uh, if you have zero and you cannot see p value equals zero, just because you cannot you cannot exclude that chance if you're doing uh, forever. So um, but if, so you you can see p value less than point oh oh one, or sometimes people add in one basically one. Uh, at the top and at one and the bottom. So it's just, uh, it then the con change the conclusion. Uh, more accurate uh, uh, here is not that meaningful. We know it's significant, right? So if everybody follow this concept, I, I, I can tell you this is probably one of the most uh, hard questions that uh, when we do metabolic people asking how it comes, but this is a very intuitive interpretation behind it. So we just shuffle the, shuffle the label and redo the uh, difference, okay? So um, advantage is that uh, we just using computer to do the uh, permutation, and we don't need to assume it's distribution. We it's uh, it's uh, uh, so also there is some hidden correlations. It will address that because it's um, the when you permute this uh, these things uh, can also be addressed. So disadvantage is you need a large number of samples. So if you have only less than ten, as I can tell you, probably uh, you cannot get. A, once on permutation, it's not uh, enough to permit once on time. It will, uh, so if you have 20 in, uh, or yeah, more than 20, probably you're fine. Computational intensive, so uh, it's not a big deal because mm, computer is getting so powerful these days. Once on the even one million permutation is, uh, it's, it's, you can finish in a re reasonable amount of time. So multi-testing, multiple testing issues. I hope most uh, of you already quite familiar with this. Why is that we talking about uh, if on the null hypothesis, if the chance is very low, like 0 0.05, we think the chance uh, it's a small one and we are willing to accept 
uh, uh, there's a true effect disregarding their small chance. But here is that we are not testing just that one, we're testing uh, a lot. For example, if we're doing 1,000, uh, uh, we have 1,000, uh, uh, here's that, uh, let's say 10,000, 10,000 peaks, uh, 10,000 peaks, and um, each one have 0.05 chance of getting there. So just by chance alone, we are going to have uh, 500 significant by chance. So uh, it is very clear, just based on theoretical, we will get 5,000. Uh, 500 uh, significant things. So this is a uh, uh, called multi-testing uh, issues because each one we ac ac accept a small chance, but when we're doing so many times, this accumulated effect, then the, the chance will be very high. So how do we deal with that? So we we can use Banfaroni correction. So which is uh, uh, just the, the cutoff p-value became more strict. Uh, how, how strict it is? You just divide the 0.05 by the number of tests you have done. So for example, if you use a univariate test 0.05, you're doing 1,000 genes and it divided by 1,000. So the adjusted cutoff became 0.0005. So this is a, a very conservative, but it's definitely, uh, you get something that's more, more confident. The other popular one is called false discovery rate. So um, it's uh, Benjamin Hodgeberg uh, things. So it's, uh, it's interpretation is, uh, is called FDR of 0.05 means that 5% among the significant metabolites are expected to be false positive. So we are not talking too much about how the FDR is calculated, but it's more accommodating. So if you use Banfaroni, you don't get a significant features, you should use FDR. So FDR is more well accepted and it's more generous. So you can get the features to work on. A lot of times, uh, if you don't get significant features, you cannot continue. So p-value, strict p-value, uh, it's not, uh, it's not um, critical in omics data analysis. Uh, the omics is for you to develop a hypothesis. If you really strict with p-value, end up you get nothing. You basically cure this omics uh, things. Omics is more for exploratory. So that you should pay attention to the p-values and don't uh, uh, too uh, like optimistic and don't use them um, like uh, you need to adjust multi-testing, but you cannot just too strict. The, the reason is that even here, you don't get significant features, but you have hypothesis and you valid using PCR or using target metabolomics and a marinate compound and indeed a change. So the p-value doesn't matter. The biology matters. So at this stage, uh, you need to be generous. So you have hypothesis some, and have some to validate it in the later stage. So you need to do things reasonable, but you don't have to be very strict. Uh, that's the beauty of omics is it gives you some flexibility and uh, you know validation needs to be done. As long as you, you do that and uh, you'll, you'll be fine. So high dimensional data, uh, uh, we are dealing with, uh, uh, so uh, uh, let's see, um, we talking about uh, t-test, ANOVA, and uh, what we are doing is at analyzing a single variable and then apply the procedure to all variables, finally doing a multiple test adjustment. So I would like you to uh, feel comfortable with what we have discussed. So we, we are mainly talking about uh, like uh, uh, T-test ANOVA, then they do multiple test adjustment. So this is univariate in things. And uh, visualization are limited to three dimensions. And how can we do the high dimension? This is something we're going to move on to uh, machine learning multivariate statistics. Questions so far? Okay. Uh, uh, so. Yes, uh, uh, about the FDR corrections. Uh, yep. What I found is uh, because I have a, a study for now, it's only have a 30 variables. It's about, uh, it's, a, it's not a metabolism, it's just uh, uh, clinical outcomes. And so for the 30, uh, variables and I have two groups. Comparison means only have a thirty comparisons. But do you, but what I found is like it, uh, after FDR, the significant all significant about like five or six all disappear. It's not like equal to uh, thirty uh, like multiply zero point zero five. 
uh, like only have a 1.5 chance got a wrong or false positive. It's all significant disappear. Do you think that makes sense? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, sometime uh, after doing FDR, it will be, become 1.0 or something. It's really depending on the ranking. So uh, it's just depending on the, how the FDR uh, was calculated. So what's the cutoff you used? Uh, 0 0.05. So FDR uh, usually can be, <laughs> usually I see people can go into 0 0.2. So it's 20%, it's all fine. And uh, also uh, I, I do see sometime you get a result like yours just because of um, the ranking of, uh, of your results. So that's, uh, on the other hand, you can uh, improve like in 0 0.1, 0 0.15 or 0 0.2. It's all okay with FDR. Um, it's not uh, like, yeah. Do you think it's that uh, another way it may make sense? It's we strict to the rho p value from 0 0.05 to 0 0.01, we consider it significant? Uh, well, uh, there's a, all about context, all about evidence. So you can use, uh, uh, some people don't even use p value, just use a photo change plus some evidence plus some literature and as long as you convince the reviews convince yourself and you do validation it's 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 fine i can tell you there's a strong movement talking about uh, uh, not too strict on p-values uh, <clears throat> but uh, but my but my suggestion is uh, see your normalization whether you did the proper normalization and see your approach whether it can be improved if you want to go to extreme, give up p-value, which is I don't, uh, I don't, uh, I'm not favoring this uh, this part. So you have to use a statistical guide you are thinking, but you need to have more evidence. Uh, so if you can uh, have statistic, it's close like marginal significant, like 0 0.05, 0 0.06, mm -hmm. but photo change is significant, and you also have other uh, peripheral evidence or literature to support, and uh, you. Uh, and it's it's yeah it's it's nothing wrong about uh, uh, about that. So uh, so it's you just need to build the context and uh, you yeah. have an argument, right? Yeah, yes. we can we may discuss later if you have all your data and see what it's about. Okay. Sure. Thank you. I think it's also important to remind people that the point zero five is is sort of an arbitrary number that is not. Um, strict it's not like a law of gravity um it's it's been a consensus but people have almost turned it into a law um and in fact uh, as jeff was pointing out you can relax it to something that's 0.1 or 0.15 um, as long as you're rationalizing or explaining it but it, but it is quite remarkable how people uh if they've got a you know p-value of point 055 they throw out their data and say it wasn't significant um and that's just wrong <laughs> it, it's, it's sort of like saying you know there's only uh up and there's only down um statistics is inherently a fuzzy science it's there's lots of grays that's right yeah so uh, we need to understand the statistics and understand the pitfalls. So use statistics properly to help us make decisions, but we cannot use less statistics to restrict us. I'm just saying as a biology wins always because at the end of the day, it's really, uh, it's person, it's clinicians, and you see the patient who actually have the things, it's not statistics. So statistics help you develop a hypothesis and you need to do some more validation and people just, uh, some clinicians don't have statistics. They just say, say things and, uh, and they make some bottom biomarkers and uh, get things work. So uh, for omics analysis, we definitely need uh, statistics and need a visualization, but we also need a strong context and biology and uh, literature, the peripheral uh, reading. So all these things need to come into play to making decisions. Don't do it very early to cut off your uh, coming uh, up downstream uh, analysis. That's what uh, I would like to say. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So, so uh, here is um, uh, we talk about uh, the general challenges. So all the traditional statistics usually not designed for uh, omics data uh, because uh, they require a huge number of replicates and we which we cannot afford. And uh, 
So what we uh, so if we want to use multivariate statistics to do such things, and uh, you can do it, <laughs> but nobody going to understand it. Nobody going to use it. And uh, I, I took the matrix algebra and uh, advanced um, advanced uh, um, mathematics matrix algebra and uh, read through it and try to use it. And uh, yeah, spend a solid uh, one and a half years. And I'm I'm giving up. Why is uh, it's just not um, so far as I don't find it um, suitable for um, for this uh, for the omics. It's hard to use, hard to understand. It's not designed with omics features in mind. So I don't see. So a lot of the matrix algebra uh, beautiful, but uh, we just don't have the data. So you you cannot uh, uh, force our data into that format, and there's no way to uh, connect easily. And uh, so we uh, so it's disappointing to see that. And uh, what else we can do is that uh, pattern recognition, machine learning, and it's when I switched to this direction, I found it's much more confident and much more uh, useful and uh, making the result also uninterpretable. The other thing is uh, called camel matrix or dimension reduction, which is also actually machine learning like PCA, PLSDA. So let's put it all together. And here's a slide that I borrowed from someone who presented in metabolomics two years ago. And uh, he is uh, really the uh, pioneer in data science, in camel metrics, in machine learning, artificial intelligence. So here's a big picture. Here's where we are. So we're talking from the right side about the statistics, hypothesis testing, and the parameter estimation, which is mean and variance, OK? And we gradually move to clustering, classification. And this is what we are going to cover in the coming. Uh, we're going to talk more on machine learning, artificial intelligence. Uh, not in this uh, workshop, maybe next year. <laughs> but uh, I think the whole idea is that we understand these basics and it's much easier to absorb than more advanced. Sometimes it's, uh, mm, basic is much more useful. And it's um, so uh, machine learning and the pattern recognition. So uh, the idea is we don't focus on individual features, we focus on the groups, focus on the patterns, which is uh, a group behavior pattern is one dot. You don't have have feel it's a pattern, but if several dots, multi dots moving together and in a location, you think that's a pattern. So uh, our eyes is very good at uh, finding patterns, and the computer also can be trained to find the patterns. So in here is that visualization, which I'm very uh, I'm kind of favor of visualization plus machine learning, unsupervised machine learning will very help very helpful for exploratory data analysis for the large omics state. So uh, we all, I hope everybody is familiar with the supervised, unsupervised. So uh, supervised is, uh, is basically you do the analysis with, while referring to why. Basically you, you only, you not, you, you try to find the core patterns in the X related to Y. Okay, unsupervised is I only want to find the things information within X. I don't know it's related to Y or not. I, I only found the inherent patterns within X. So this is more uh, just uh, X alone and uh, supervised X plus Y, okay? So uh, uh, unsupervised machine learning for high dimensional data. And there's uh, two general categories called clustering and dimension reduction, okay? And uh, for example, PCA, and, but sometimes people think of PCA also clustering. So it's all fine based on your, you, how do you view your result. So w what's the key idea here is that uh, because we, our human mind, brain, we can only think about a few variables, okay? Now, if we give you give 1,000 or 10,000, what you cannot comprehend it easily. Uh, what you can do is a classroom. Basically, you put the things that are similar to each other into an individual block. Uh, for example, uh, you put 1,000 uh, variables into 10 clusters. Basically, each cluster became more homogeneous. So you can think about this 10 cluster or 10 unit rather than think about the 1,000 unit. So it will help you to uh, uh, easier uh, to uh, in terms of your think about the behavior. You're not thinking about the 10,000, you think about 10. Uh, so that's uh, that's uh, simplify the interpretation, and then if you see the ten different cluster, then you focus on individual cluster. What each <clears throat> class is about. 
So we divide and conquer. So this is how uh, uh, the approach try to help you. How do we do a clustering? And uh, uh, well, clustering is put the similar things sim uh, too close to each other. And how, how we need to marry the simil uh, similarity. And uh, uh, at some point that we think is similar enough and put them into one cluster, okay? So we need a marrying similarity. We need a threshold to think, okay, after that, they are, they are the same. So I'll be uh, farther than that, they are not the same. So this is something, the key parameters for doing the um, clustering. So uh, um, commonly used method like k-means, uh, they are called partitioning method. So uh, k, basically, if you're doing the k-means, you want to give them a k, k is basically your belief, how many, how many uh, cluster you anticipated there, for example, uh, three means, it means you, you, K equals three, you means that there are three clusters or K medians. So they are, you, you are not based on mean, you are based on median. So it's very flexible uh, and it's very powerful. And the only downside that you're not sure beforehand how many uh, clusters there. Of course, you can run a test from one to 10 and see which uh, clustering patterns have a very a tight clustering thing. So it's, it's, it's um, common. The other most commonly used is hierarchical clustering. So this one is basically your hands-free. You don't need to specify any parameter. They will try to cluster from the bottom uh, all the way to the top. So from everything uh, is a, cl a cluster, individual cluster, then became one cluster in the end. So uh, let's talk about hierarchical clustering. So um, so you don't need to specify uh, the, the, the how many clusters you want to get. So what it does is find the two closest object and merge them together. Then you merge the next two closest object. And then you try to merge even, even because the next layer, the cluster became one individual object. So you need to marry the uh, uh, whole distance between object and the distance between the cluster. And uh, so until just doing this until it's been done. So it's boring. It just repeat and repeat. So computer is very good at it. Mm. So all the key parameters, similarity between samples, or similarity between clusters, then we just repeat and everything will be calculated in a few seconds. And you will see the result easily from everything and to only everything one class to the one. So you can visualize the group patterns and decide which number of class you want to have. So you cut out that level. And that's the flexibility of hierarchical clustering. The similarity, you mean the distance closer or you mean other like uh, sphere manipulation similarity? Yeah, we will discuss that later. So similarity is a, um, is a parameter you can, uh, you, 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 you need to choose by absolute distance, Euclidean distance, and correlation coefficient. It's all kind of similarity. Some of this, for example, ec ecological similarity. It's quite different. If we're doing a microbiome, the environment is very different. It also, evolutionary distance. So all these things is uh, we just use the concept similarity. But uh, how it's being calculated is uh, you can you can give uh, use your own calculation based on your specific um, uh, field. So we'll discuss late later. So k-mean clustering. K-mean clustering is that um, we need to specify k and uh, then we want to put everything close to this uh, seed. Uh, we need to give a K then it, and that give K seed. This K seed can be a uh, random uh, put it there or just randomly choosing one of the uh, uh, current variables and starting from that. And you choose the next uh, uh, object that is close to your seed and put them together. And just uh, if, if it's similar uh, in higher uh, than the threshold and you put them cluster. And then if, an, uh, if it's similar to that state and put that close to that cluster. So, um, um, so for example, here is a k-mean cluster and uh, uh, it's just a, uh, you, uh, uh, you visually say it's two cluster, but uh, let computer decide how, how to do that k-mean and whether they can find it. I, I actually, it's because it's so clear and the computer is very smart. And in this case, they will easily find it's two cluster. So you, uh, A, you can see that's the data and it's B and you drop to seed. I just think there's two clusters and uh, then you drop it to there. 
and you can see in the C, you can see uh, the red one assigned to the red seed and blue one assigned to the blue seed. And because they are close to that, you just assign to that. Now you re recon rec recalculate the centroid. And when you, uh, when you uh, assign that initially, then you remove that two random seeds you dropped. Then you calculate centroid. You can see that in D, the centroid became more already moved to individual cluster. So the red one in, is on the below red cross and the blue cross in the top. And uh, then you're doing one more thing and it already converge and stabilize this. And then one more thing at F, it's very stable. The center in the uh, blue one in the center of blue and the red one in the center of blue. So once you do more iteration, there's no change. It converge and it's done. So uh, K means it's uh, very efficient. Also, if you have a huge amount of data, uh, almost hierarchical K means that the one is currently, uh, can run easily and some other Classroom could could take much longer. That's the, so. This is similarity. How do we measure similarity? I mentioned about the, there's a lot of the different uh, approaches. Here we talk talk about Euclidean distance. Basically, this is just uh, uh, we know in a Cartesian uh, coordinates and x and y. This is a um, um, minus and a squared. So this is a, we usually do this. So this is fine, commonly used, but it's not necessarily the best one. So Pearson correlation. So it, it, this is more about similarity. And uh, you can see uh, it is, has a sign, uh, plus positive, negative. You can see from left side, it's all positive correlation is uh, one. And that one right side is all negative correlation is minus one. So uh, sometimes the direction matters. Um, and um, uh, so how do you calculate the, the similarity? It's really depending how you think this similarity is meaningful. Direction matters or not? Or uh, just absolute distance. There's Manhattan distance, there's a lot of things. So um, uh, that's, I, yeah, I, there's no absolute uh, answer. So you need to try or need to think about uh, uh, the distance mirror there. Also clustering. And uh, when you have the cluster, how do you uh, marry it? Uh, how do you put them together? <laughs> cluster distance between, once you assign a cluster, how do you do the, uh, how close they are. One is called a single linkage. A single linkage is try to use the closest data point. You can see that uh, uh, lines between here. It is single linkage. And of course, there's as a tend to generate very long chains and uh, complete linkages try to use a, a furthest uh, to, to a data point. You can see it here. So it, uh, this is a, a generated clump. So uh, most people probably use the average and so average is more, more give the result is more reasonable sometimes. But uh, why it's there is that uh, uh, for some time it do working well, uh, single and uh, complete. So average is uh, more, more, there's also ward or ward too, if you use some of the algorithm, it is slightly improved uh, for some subtleties. So most time this is, a, um, you, you just don't need to care about too much about that. So hierarchical clustering and a heat map. So hierarchical clustering we discussed. So clustering is, uh, you can see here, we, uh, we color the clustering called a cheese or dendrogram on the right uh, figure. And you can see some of the clustering there. And the most uh, interesting one is that uh, called a heat map. Heat map is your data. It's exactly your data. It just didn't show that number in your Excel. It shows in color. And uh, so this is red and green. So uh, hopefully you're not color blinded. And uh, if, it's, if you see people, our eyes is very sensitive to the colors. So we can easily see some patterns, uh, dark red or, or, um, uh, or dark green or, or black uh, patches of inside your, uh, inside this uh, heat map. So if you display everything like, uh, um, like a number, absolute connotation there, you will normalize, you don't see anything. And uh, that's, that's a clustering plus, plus heat map really give you a lot of the power uh, to help you to discover patterns to do more hypothesis testing. So this one is uh, uh, developed in the microarray, but it's been very popular in a lot of uh, studies. 
So uh, PCA, we mentioned about PCA is a very important for metabolomics, also used uh, uh, widely in a single cell RNA-seq. So the main idea for PCA is that the main directional variance is the main data characteristics. PCA try to capture the most, uh, 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 capture the dimension that a capture so, so we talk about dimension is the number of variable inside your data. So if we talk about like metabolomics, we have hundreds to thousands of dimensions, but PCA will condense them into two or three dimensions. So these two or three dimensions that capture most of variance. So with the variance, we think the change uh, of, uh, of the data is the most characteristics of data. So this assumption is most time is meaningful, especially you are uh, your phenotype, your drug treatment cause a huge change of your data, of the data, then it's definitely going to capture it here. It's, uh, that's, that's um, how PCA works. And so um, you see a big- I, I could just mention something as well, because it was brought up early on, which was this issue of dependent variables and independent variables. And another way of thinking about PCA is that it converts a lot of dependent variables into a small number of independent variables. And it, it, in, it inherently finds the correlations, uh, things that are highly correlated, uh, kind of gets rid of them, simplifies them and reduces them to the things that are uh, somewhat uncorrelated. And so that's, um, that's another way of thinking about PCA. Yeah, I, 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 I they've got a good point here is that uh, if once you're doing a PCA, all the uh, new dimensions and become uh, orthogonal, they are not correlated. And the downside is that <laughs> this uh, new uh, new dimension is we don't know, uh, they lose their original IDs, so they're not metabolized anymore. They became just PC1, PC2. So that's the interpretation became challenged, but the interdependency is this removed. Uh, for metabolomics, PCA working very well because the uh, metabolites is actually also peaks. It's quite uh, interdependent, and we can summarize the data very well in PCA. It's it's interesting why we don't do it in the uh, transcriptomics in the uh, microarray, and uh, I then I tried the PCA on this data. A way I found most time PCA doesn't working well. Why? It's because the correlation in between the uh, genes. Uh, it's not as strong as metabolites. So the PCA does not reduce the, um, uh, uh, the dimension in a meaningful way, like what they did in metabo uh, met metabolomics data. So that's why they didn't use it too much uh, or don't find it useful in um, transcriptomics. But in a single cell, it's working well. So I will, I will see that. So important is the PCA reduce the interdependency. So the more in interdependent correlated your data, the better PCA are going to work. If every data point, every variable is totally random, the PCA will give a perfect sphere, the round ball. They not does not give you too much better. So, so here is the PCA try to summarize in a, a, in a two D. This is a bagel. So three you want to project in two. So uh, the the O O shape is really capturing a, a more variance, which is the your PC the. Uh, hot dog part is not uh, as too much variance. So you basically, you, uh, if you have to choose between uh, uh, O and the hot dog, you have to choose O because that's clearly give you more variance and capture more characteristics of your data. So um, this is PCA and how it does is, uh, <laughs> this is a mathematical details and I, I don't think you should pay too much attention. It's a very linear, uh, linear mm, uh, uh, transformation. So it's very fast most time and uh, your original variable. So on the bottom is that a T1, a T1 is your PC, and it's, it's basically the score. It, it is calculated by the, your um, co 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 coefficient multiplied by your original variable. So this, uh, uh, this coefficient became loading. And uh, um, so, uh, so, so the more impactful your coefficient or more particular um, variable, it's more important that uh, they will have a stronger uh, or in terms of absolute value will be larger, okay? And have a much impact on generating the PCA score. So uh, this is, um, 
uh, how we we are going to later discuss how the scores uh, VIPs it's it's here is that uh, how they affect is because of the here they became co correlated coefficient they are both the sign more positive negative or the absolute value have matters because they will direct affecting the fi final number calculated here so uh, so you can actually rank them easily are they positive are they negative absolute value to find who is most uh, inf uh, who is most uh, inf impactful uh, loadings or features. So uh, keep in mind that the PCA can be applied to uh, just a matrix. You can use a correlation or covariant matrix. So if you use covariant matrix, variable must be in the same unit. Emphasize variable that's the most uh, have most variance. So the correlation matrix you basically standardized with mean and standard deviation, and uh, um, the variable can be in a different unit because you standardize them after that. All variable have the same act on the uh, analysis. So. Again, is that this is uh, your consideration and you need to keep it in mind. So sometimes you do the uh, scaling, basically make them standardized or use the covariance and we, we just emphasize um, the overall things. So uh, uh, I need to get faster because we're close to our break. Um, and so uh, here is a, a what PCA does is uh, you see from this spectra, you get this PCA plot, which is beautifully separating the uh, samples. Now you feel happy about it, but uh, uh, this uh, samples is called a, a, a PCA with samples is called a scores plot. Basically, this is your new transformed coordinate to capture most variance. So, and this most variance actually correlated with your phenotypes, which is a very good news. And now you want to see which one con contributes to this um, separation. And it's called loading plot. Loading plot, which eventually is your coordinate, uh, is your co 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 coefficient, which uh, uh, positive, negative, uh, or value big or small will drive this uh, um, uh, you, 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 your sample to the directions correspondingly. So if we go to next one, uh, which is this one, I put scores and loadings on the same, <clears throat> uh, same. Uh, slides you can see the uh, how to interpret them intuitively. So, for example, this is uh, uh, four groups and they separate very well on the score plot on the left, uh, and uh, on the uh, on the right is your loadings. So, the loadings on the on this um, uh, top uh, top left will be positively correlated with the green uh, green things. So, essentially, this one uh, is driving the separation uh, towards the uh, uh, top right the top left so uh, similarly uh, uh, the on the loading plot uh, on the right the on the bottom um, bottom right it will be positively correlated with the stars brown stars it it will drive them to there so uh, uh, and similarly to the um, all these corners so this one is very clear to interpret because they are good separated but most time if it separates not well you just capture the on the edge so uh, the edge distribution on the score plot on the edge is margins more have a more uh, power, especially the, I'm talking about uh, away from the center. So, P, so PCA is uh, also, you can interpret the PCA is rotating. Uh, your PCA is a uh, transform your data and uh, your data actually essentially the same, but it's rotating the uh, axis. So, so the first axis is uh, correspond to the biggest variance, and the second one to second biggest variance. So this is uh, you can interpret it that way. And uh, what is good for is data overview. So if you want to the QC, and usually you are going to use PCA, you can also do some box plot across different samples of features. You can also, also good for outlier detection, and uh, you can also good look at the relationships between variables. So you can see here is that. Uh, Go back to this uh, loading plot. Loading plot is about variables who contribute to the separation. Score plot is all about samples. So on the loading plot, the, 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 these variables close to, close to each other are similar to each other. So they are positively, they are similar to each other. So they are also uh, most likely positive correlated. So this is a, when it's look at the relationship between different variables. Some, some variables, uh, if they close to each other, they are similar to each other. So uh, PCA uh, is unsupervised, as I mentioned, and uh, if it's working well, and basically you, you're almost done because that uh, means that your inherent data structure already reflecting your experimental conditions. So the effect is very strong and obvious. 
and uh, but a lot of time, especially in clinical data, and uh, and it's that not that um, promising. So you need to use more uh, supervised approach. So PSD PLSDA is a supervised uh, approach. It maximizing the covariance. So PCA is maximizing the variance. PLSD is max maximizing covariance between the data matrix X and the um, Y. So they considering X and Y together. So it is supervised. So PLSDA is very always try to please you. So it will always produce certain separations, even if it's for the random things. So P PLSD is a very popular, but because you can always get something, but PLSD also overfitting issues we are going to discuss later. So, um, so we need to be cautious. Here's a uh, result in metabolism. We do PCA, then we do PLSDA. You can see that on the top, left there's not so much separation if you're doing PLSDA you can see separation became much better so this is in general uh, you always get a better result from PLSDA but with well at meaningful and you need to do more uh, testing and validation so PLSDA is a very susceptible to overfitting and so overfitting means the patterns you see from the computer like that separation it's not necessarily the real pattern you can give some random samples. There's no that absolutely no separation. PLSD will all also give you some, uh, could also give you some sub pattern like that. How do we deal with that? We need to use some machine learning approach, and one is called cross validation. One is called permutation. So permutation we already discussed. Basically, randomly shuffle the label and redo the computing and see the dis di distance between that two groups. Are they that groups? Uh, center of that two groups. For example, these two groups is is the um, same distance or as or, or different distance so we can always do that and the cross validation we are going to discuss so uh, uh, later so overfitting overfitting is that um, uh, the, we found patterns that's only uh, suitable for this particular data but when you use this uh, patterns to or rule to predict the new data it doesn't work well. That means you are not generalized to the population. So we want the biomarkers to be working in a population, okay? We don't want to work only in your own data. You want to work in 100%, it doesn't matter because you are once translating your discovery to the general population. So overfitting had to be reduced. You want to see the true performance and it working well. So what, uh, how overfitting happens is, uh, of course, over the, the picture below shows you some things about uh, uh, distribution of the data point. On the uh, right, as you can see, it's overfitting because the data naturally has some variations. If you really fit everything uh, data point and as like a curves, you, you're overfitting uh, because that's the, you're fitting the noise. That's the, on the left side is that uh, it, there's some, it patterns, it's real patterns. So, and you ignore them, uh, give that straight line. So you're not doing a good job. So the best one is is uh, um, the second and middle one. It's just right. So you you fitting true signals, not fitting noises. So this is one is uh, conceptually you should uh, try to get the best model, a uh, most powerful one, but not overfitting model. So if you underfitting, also not good because you should do a better job than that. So how do you do that? Is a cross validation is post most commonly used. Cross validation is try to divide your samples into uh, different um, uh, different sections. Then you try to do the use the one to chain and predict the one is not used for to build the model. So for example, the bottom, you chain your models using two thirds and predict in a one third the test. So you can always rotate the three sections, the other two to predict the first then the, the other two predict the middle one. So you can do tenfold cross validation or leave one out cross validation. Leave one out basically, if you have 100 samples, you can do use a 99 to build model, predict the one, and you, you do it 100 times. So uh, that's, that's all doable. And uh, this is leave one out. So it's more granular. <laughs> uh, Jack, so, sorry, but like we are 10 minutes late. If you can please try to wrap up, thank you. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of questions. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, so uh, cross validation is uh, um, used to um, uh, to 
tell you how good it is uh, your model. For PSD, it is also on like R square, Q square, and so uh, so um, so cross validate R square is uh, also known as Q square. So it's a prediction accuracy. So it's, it's also popularly used. And so permutation test. So we I'm not going to give you too much on this because we covered the in very well in the previous one. So you just shuffled everything and do the test and calculate how how uh, how separate they are. And um, so if we're doing permutation uh, and we see our result is far away, then we are doing fine. If we it's squarely in the center, then that means that we don't have too much signals in our data. It's almost like a uh, shuffled data. So uh, <clears throat> uh, PSDA we found it out is that uh, uh, it is not talking about the variance; it's talking about the covariance. So, uh, but in in the score plot, all this kind of separation here is talking about the variance. So sometimes your variance, your first component, uh, explain. Uh, Less variance compared to second component. Why is that? The component is uh, here is not maximize the variance; it's maximize covariance. So, so I sometimes got the questions about this, and uh, I wrote down on the web. So make sure you <laughs> you scroll down and see what's the interpretation. So, uh, so we have this uh, R square Q square, and uh, we will cover it in the lab section next one. So also for, for for have VIP scores, we're talking about the feature coefficient co uh, co coefficient, and uh, uh, and VIP is uh, basically adapt from this uh, uh, co coefficient, and uh, have much uh, have some other meanings to make it more robust. So VIP higher than one is important, less than one is uh, less important. So this is an empirical rule. So this is for example here that. Uh, uh, VIP plot from tab analyst, and you can use your one to see uh, higher than one, probably more useful for biomarkers and downstream analysis. So uh, finally, is uh, we talk about uh, the um, going to talk about uh, the uh, performance, and so there's a uh, uh, accuracy error rate. So. Um, uh, uh, so this one is not suitable for imbalanced data. Why is that? If we, uh, for example, use uh, um, some disease that's not so, um, have so many occurrence, so only five in 1,000 people. If you, you put everything as healthy and you, you have 99.5% right, but it's not useful. So, um, so the accuracy of, uh, is not, um, more meaningful is not so meaningful in clinical. So clinical actually looking at uh, uh, sensitivity, specificity, and true positive, true negative, false positive, false negative. So this one is uh, well covered. So basically, you want to see uh, how many healthy you are diagnosed as healthy, how many disease you are diagnosed as a disease. So true positive, true negative. Basically, it's emphasized you have to work uh, well for negative and positive and rather than just focus on overall one single value. So if we put this positive negative emphasize true positive true negative and uh, we are going to get this uh, uh, it's, it's making a good decision. So uh, how do we how do we uh, if the population have a natural overlap and we have a cutoff and uh, we know uh, we are going to sacrifice something that's going to true, true negative uh, false negative, true positive, false not, uh, positive. If you have this one, uh, and uh, we want to, if we want to combine the, all of them into one single number, uh, it is called the RC curve. So receiver operating characteristic curve. It is uh, used for reader studies, uh, but it's also summarizing uh, what we want. Basically, give you both. And uh, how do we generate that? We just uh, <laughs> do the cutoff and moving around, and uh, we connect them. And basically, this RC curve, and um, so RC curve is widely used in clinical, and uh, because it captures both positive, uh, for true positive and true negative. So you can uh, basically what people want to select is uh, uh, you want to uh, have a trade-off. It's really depending how much cost. Okay, and uh, so um, here is that uh, you have a high sensitivity, uh, and you 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 have a 
and here is a balanced uh, uh, sensitivity and uh, specificity, and here is have a high specificity. So which one you want, it depending on your disease and cost. And when it combined, it's called area under the RC cable called AOC. So this is more commonly used for compare biomarker performance. So uh, here is the a AOC, 95%, uh, and 100%, uh, If <laughs> so 95% is pretty good and 100% very rare, and, uh, but in, uh, in our research, most times we see this is 70%. So 70% is not that useful. So you have to be higher than that. And in the bottom is random, so you have no performance. So other classification method, uh, like SIMCA, OPRS, SVM, random forest, they all available. And not SIMCA is not available. Why? It's because uh, it's proprietary. I don't want to get some lawsuit. And the uh, idea is, uh, idea is uh, it's, it's, it's very good, but uh, it's commercial. But uh, OPRS support vector machine random forest is very powerful too. So um, uh, we talk about this uh, unsupervised method. We talk about supervised uh, method, and we talk about the statistical significance. And uh, so just to pay attention to um, uh, uh, the when you're doing supervised, and you meet pay attention to the overfitting because uh, it is uh, don't uh, be be too excited if you don't, didn't do overfit, you see some uh, patterns, you think that's true. So you make sure cross validation permutation is done properly and before you uh, became, uh, be, 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 be celebrate. But if you unsupervised the method is doing good separation, you mostly are safe, okay? So here's that uh, 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 one we just mentioned. So. Um, if we don't see a good separate from PCA, you need to be very cautious uh, to the next step. So if you're doing PCA good separation and the PSDA, the other remaining will most likely doing good and you have signals. So if you want to do the PSDA supervised uh, um, analysis, usually you need a good number of replicates. So uh, sample size needs to be decent. So if you don't see good separation in PCA, you only have about six samples, you still want a good classification, nobody's going to believe that, okay? That's just an impossible task. So let's, uh, let me see. So finally, this is, uh, it's you, it's biology. So uh, don't uh, put, don't just think about uh, the statistics or machine learning, really, you use the right tools, use steps that will make a huge difference. And you just understand them, use them properly. It's up to you and uh, and the biology and uh, other literature. And you have to interpret everything there and to come up with a convincing story. So just using the statistics, uh, give a list of you try. I tried to metabolize use this method, this method, this method, and get this result. And uh, if I'm reviewing paper like this, I will be very annoyed. And where's biology? And you still need to think a lot and put all the results into context. And you don't have to use all the results. You just uh, use the results that are uh, uh, easy to interpret and are supporting your story. So that's, uh, uh, that's uh, I think, it's, uh, from a reviewer point of view, it's much, 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 much easy to, uh, to accept. Uh, you cannot give uh, uh, just a lot of the result without your own interpretation. That's uh, that's a lot of people try to, uh, with metabolites, they can easily get a lot of result. That's um, just be cautious on that. Guess that's it.